Welcome to our second training now of the Brief Observation of Symptoms of Autism, the BOSA. And I want to quickly introduce my team. Let me stop sharing my screen so you can see everyone. So I am joined today by some other members from the Kathy Lord Lab at UCLA. So uh, Dr. Chrissy Tulin and Dr. Allison Holbrook. Also Catherine Byrne is on the line. And then we are so lucky to also have Dr. Sophie Kim from Cornell joining us, uh, who's one of the principal investigators on this project with Dr. Kathy Lord. All right, let me share again. Let's see. All right. So let's go over some of our disclosures first. So Kathy Lord does receive royalties from Western Psychological Services or WPS for the ADOS, the SCQ and the ADIR. And uh, the BOSA is actually adapted from the ADOS and the BOSC, which is a measure uh, of change over treatment. And because of that, the BOSA is copyrighted by WPS and some of the panelists today are authors of the BOSA, but it's not for sale and it does not yield any royalties. To go over some housekeeping items first, is the training being recorded? Yes, the training will be available on UCLA CART's YouTube channel afterward. Uh, we will be taking out the videos of individuals that will be showing to protect their privacy, but everything else will be available for you or for colleagues to watch later. If you came to the training last week, you don't need to watch again. We are going over the exact same information. So feel free to drop off if that's the case. Will the slides be posted? Yes, we will put those up with the talk on the CART website so you can access all of that together. In order to access the BOSA materials, we do have a permission of use agreement form that you'll need to sign. Uh, and then you will be directed to a link on Google Drive that actually has all of the materials that will be available to you. And what is this permission agreement? So as part of our agreement with WPS, we do need each person who's going to administer the BOSA to submit one of these. And we'll go over some of the uh, requirements, but you do need to be an ADOS user uh, to use it and you have to agree not to make modifications. You can get a certificate. We are actually at the end of this talk, we'll, we will be giving links to both that permission use agreement as well as the certificate that you can generate for yourself for being at the training today. Unfortunately, if you watch the training afterwards, so not live, we are not able to give certificates for those people. We really hope that you work collaboratively with your clinical team to learn the BOSA, but we recommend that each person individually watches a recording of the training since it will be available for all of you to see. And we actually have all of the materials ready for you. So as soon as you fill out that permission agreement, you will get uh, linked to the Google Drive so you can see it. The BOSA does not cost anything. Uh, we are providing all of these written materials for free, but there are some materials that will be in addition to the ADOS that you will need to purchase. I think it's around $100, and we have a, a list of all of those materials that you can purchase either online or in stores. All right, so the agenda today, we're going to introduce you to what the BOSA is. You're going to learn how to administer it and how to coach the examiner, which would either be a parent or another therapist working with the individual. We'll watch some examples to give you an idea. And we'll also discuss coding guidelines and clinical considerations. All right, so what is the BOSA? So we noticed there was this gap uh, with COVID-19 and needing to socially distance. Uh, Dr. Lord was getting lots of emails asking whether people could use the ADOS with a mask through telehealth. And her answer is, unfortunately, no, it's not an ADOS if you are altering it in that way. And it's not a natural social interaction the same way um, that we would expect from the ADOS. So we can't use the ADOS, but we need something. So we uh, have been developing the BOSA to fill in that gap. And so the BOSA provides a standardized context of activities. And this is adapted actually from activities in the ADOS and from activities in the BOSC. So I mentioned the BOSC earlier. The BOSC is the Brief Observation of Social Communication Change. And that was developed so we can measure change over short time periods of treatment. 
Uh, so knowing what we know from our, the development of the BOSC and also from the ADOS, we have developed this new measure called the BOSA, and it can be administered by a parent or a therapist, uh, and it only takes 12 to 14 minutes, so much briefer than the ADOS. I want to be clear that this is not yet validated. So we have not tested this in different populations yet, uh, but we are looking for teams to collaborate and to share their de-identified data. So we do have, you know, data based on the BOSC and the ADOS. We know that the BOSC is a context that we get a lot of really great, uh, rich information about social communication. And so we have adapted it from that. Uh, we also are using ADOS codes. Of course, we know a lot about ADOS codes and we have done some research on ways to make ADOS codes um, from the zero to three coding that we currently use to a binary, whether the symptom exists or not, a presence or absence. So I'll talk more about that. Uh, but basically the point is we have used as much research as we possibly could to back up these decisions that we've made, but we have not validated the BOSA yet. So we really would love your help uh, and we'd love as you start seeing some participants uh, for you to share that data with us. So clinicians who are familiar with the ADOS can observe the BOSA. And so again, this is done by a parent or a therapist. And so you as the clinician would be observing this. And then you can complete many of the ADOS codes based on that observation. You can transfer those codes to a DSM-5 checklist and that can be recoded into a BOSA code. And we'll go through all of this. I'll show you some examples of these DSM-5 checklists and how you can transfer the codes. And basically this will give you evidence of whether the child may meet criteria for autism spectrum disorder or not. So this is a tool that's designed to assist in your clinical decision making. So um, you have to really use your clinical expertise with this. It's not meant to replace the ADOS. This is not a long-term solution um, instead of the ADOS. This is really something that we've put together during this COVID-19 time so we have something we can use. And this should be done in combination with a thorough developmental history as you would normally use to make a diagnosis. You should also um, be using a parent report measure. Of course, we love the ADIR because it is so thorough and comprehensive, uh, but we know not everyone uses that, but make sure you're getting good parent report of symptoms as well. Who can administer? So we are calling this seasoned ADOS users. So basically, we want people who already are using the ADOS, they're ADOS trained, they have maybe attended a clinical training or they've been trained by someone who is familiar in the ADOS at their own site, uh, but you do not need to be research reliable to be able to use the BOSA. You also need to attend a BOSA training. So like I said, if you were able to come today or to our last training, if not, uh, we will have this posted online. So if you have colleagues that weren't able to make it, they can attend one of, or they can watch one of those trainings online. You must have and use original ADOS2 protocols, and you cannot modify the BOSA materials in any way. Um, one thing we are looking at right now is translating some of the parent materials and questions that will be given to parents. Uh, so far, we have not been able to do any of that, but if you are interested in translating, please contact us, and, and that's something we would, we would be interested in looking more into. So how can you administer this in a socially distant way? So ideally, if you have a nice clinic set up with an observation window, you could be behind the window and then the parent and the child or whoever you're watching would be in the clinical room. Uh, that's a great way, especially if you can have communication back and forth with them. You could also use a platform like Zoom. Uh, so any telemedicine, telehealth platform, and you could do this two ways. You could actually have the participant and uh, their parent or therapist in their home. You could also do it within your own clinic, uh, have them in one room, you can be in another and you can have a Zoom setup or a telehealth setup so you can communicate with each other and watch the observation. You could also be in the same room um, with your PPE at a good social distance. You could have you know, a shield up, whatever your hospital requires, but that would be one option as well. And then finally, you could video record the observation. And this is something that can be watched and coded later. So there are a few different options depending on what your setup is and what your circumstances, either in the clinic or in the home. So I wanna just go through some of the materials and I'm actually gonna start on this right side of the screen because this is what you hopefully already have. You have your ADOS2 kit, 
Uh, you have your ADOS2 protocols for scoring. And then um, we are going to provide you with a supplemental materials list for things that are in addition to the ADOS. There's also certain ADOS materials that would be difficult to clean and sanitize. Um, for example, a lot of the baby dolls have cloth bodies. So there are certain things that we would recommend uh, for sanitation purposes that you would replace for those as well. Just a few uh, as part of the ADOS kit. The things that we are providing as part of the BOSA, so we will be giving you clinical guidelines of how to do this and how to do every version of it. You'll get instructions for the caregiver or the therapist that's working with the individual so they have a visual support of what they're supposed to do. You'll also be giving, given question cards for conversational bids. And so this is so, um, you know, we can elicit some of those things like emotion and responsibility and understanding of social relationships. We have some questions in there uh, that the parent and the individual or the therapist can ask each other. Uh, we also do have additional items from other ADOS modules that we thought may be helpful. So if the child is a module one, uh, based on their language level and age, you will use a module one protocol from the ADOS, but we will have some additional items that may or may not uh, be helpful in your clinical decision making. And so we will have those for you to attach to your protocol. We also have DSM-5 checklists uh, that I talked about earlier that you can map on these symptoms and the scores that you have. And then we are also providing clinical summary examples. And so these are examples of how you would potentially write this up in a report to describe what you did. All right, so now I'm going to hand it over to Allison Holbrook so she can talk about some of the administration for the BOSA. Um, so we have four versions of the BOSA and you will select which version based on the individual's age and their language level. So the BOSA MV is for minimally verbal individuals of any age, uh, meaning they're nonverbal or they use only single words or rote phrases. The BOSA PSYF is for individuals with flexible phrase speech at any age or for individuals that are verbally fluent under the age of six to eight. So there's a range there. And when you're determining which version to use for six to eight year olds, you'll want to use your clinical judgment while taking into consideration um, the child's verbal ability and their attention span. So the PSYF provides um, a little bit more structure. It's play-based. It's meant to elicit conversation around a joint activity. Whereas the uh, BOSA F1 involves a turn-taking game, having to answer questions from the ADOS, and then also having a conversation without the materials present. So you'll want to take into consideration what the activities are and what you think the child's abilities are. Um, so the BOSA F1, as I mentioned, is for verbally fluent children. Um, they can be as young as six um, and then up through age 10. And then lastly, we have the BOSA F2, which is for verbally fluent children um, age 11 up through adults. So before you get started with this, you'll want to make sure that you um, prepare the environment bring in, uh, before bringing in the child and caregiver. Um, you should make sure the room is set up. You want to make sure that you have all the materials ready. Um, and I will actually show you in a minute what like a suggested setup might look like. Um, you want to make sure that you review the instructions with the caregiver, discuss what they should do during each activity, and then you'll also give them the instruction sheet. They're allowed to keep that with them during the assessment so that they can refer back to it if they feel lost um, during the assessment. And then you'll want to arrange where they're sitting and the materials. And again, I'll show you a little layout, but it's fine to make markers, have, have the chairs labeled where you want them to sit, have things labeled where you want the toys to be. So they know exactly like where they need to be and where their ch children need to be so that you can observe well. Um, and with that, you want to make sure they know where that you're observing from. So we don't want them blocking with the toys or their body or anything like that. So it'll be different for everyone depending on which um, administration you're going to be using. So as Deanna mentioned, you might be observing from um, an observation room. So you'll want to make sure that that view is clear 
or if you're on Zoom, that the Zoom camera is angled appropriately so that you can see both the child um, and the caregiver and the materials. So just really taking into consideration which how you are administering it and then making sure that you'll be able to get a clear view of as much of what's going on as possible so that you can um, confidently code. Um, and then you also should let the caregiver know um, that you will be telling them when to move on um, from each activity. Again, depending on how you are administering this, whether you're in a different room via Zoom or watching it later, you might um, knock on the window and that might indicate that you are doing it. You might just verbally prompt them, it's time to clean up and move to the next activity. Or if they're video recording it and you're doing it later, you might give them a timer and have that scheduled so that it goes off um, on an, the appropriate intervals. Um, and Lastly, before they begin, make sure that you go over any questions. We want to make sure that the caregiver or examiner feels comfortable knowing that they are doing this assessment and we are not providing a lot of um, feedback during it. Um, so as I mentioned, there are four versions and I'll begin by going over the minimally verbal version. Um, so for the BOSA MV, we have toys and bubbles, um, and the assessment is typically done on the floor. Um, we like the adult to sit across or kitty corner from the child to make sure that we get the best view of their face and the materials. Um, and then we want to allow the child to choose a toy, um, but then we need to um, remove the remaining toys from their reach so that they don't just have open access throughout the assessment. So that might be pulling them a little bit towards you as the caregiver, um, but still having them there so that you can get out more toys as necessary to help engage the child for the full time. We have it set, like this shows, like you could have an observation, you could have the Zoom set up, set up where the camera is, or it could actually be a camera that you then are watching later. Um, but we're trying to not have any of the materials block the camera or the clinician's view of what's going on. So the BOSA MV includes four activities and should be 12 minutes. Um, the materials for Toy Set 1 and 2 are primarily made up of ADOS toys. Um, the list can be found um, in the online BOSA materials that you will have access to. Um, we, will also, uh, we also recommend purchasing, purchasing replacement toys for items that are difficult to clean. So, for example, you may want to buy an all-plastic baby doll to replace a cloth one um, that isn't as easily cleaned. Or the same kind of thing for the family dolls that are in the ADOS. You might want to buy ones that are all plastic um, if the clothes on your ADOS ones are cloth and difficult to clean. During the um, BOSA MV, we really want to encourage the caregiver and um, child to play naturally together um, throughout all of the activities. Um, and for caregivers that may find it challenging um, to play, we've provided a few written ideas of how they can do this with their child and the materials. Um, and during the bubble activities, the child and examiner should stand up, feel free to move around um, during this activity. It really gives us opportunity to see some things that we don't necessarily see when the child is seated. Um, we really want the caregiver and examiner to play naturally together, the caregiver and the child to play naturally together. Um, and we want the caregiver to do their best to balance between following in on their child's lead and then offering their own ideas. Um, and as a clinician um, observing the BOSA, it's okay to give the caregiver a little bit of feedback if they're being either too directive, asking too many questions, or if they're being too passive and just sitting and watching their child play. And we'll actually be creating videos um, of the BOSA that we can share to help instruct um, families and clinicians. One of the things that we do want to remember is to remove all of the other materials um, from the room. Um, we only want them to have access to the materials that are part of the assessment. Um, this little guy had brought in a few of his own um, cars that he then didn't want to let go of and so sometimes that can make the transitions harder um, and especially when the parent is involved. So just asking them them to leave materials outside or have a somewhere that the family can feel comfortable putting those materials while they are doing this assessment. So now we'll go ahead and um, discuss the BOSA PSYF. 
Um, so it'll be a similar um, setup where we want them sitting across from each other or kitty corner. Um, this version can easily be done at a table or on the floor, depending on what seems most appropriate for the age of the participant. But again, we don't want the materials blocking either the camera or the Zoom screen or the um, live observer. So keeping that in mind when you're setting up your room. Um, so the both the PSYF is five, activity, five activities and um, lasts 14 minutes. Um, as with the minimally verbal version, the toy sets are primarily made up of ADOS materials and um, only the ones that are difficult to clean uh, really need to be replaced. Um, in this version, you'll see that we do bubbles once. Um, instead of twice, like the minimally verbal, but we've actually added the dollhouse activity, um, which is in there two times. Um, this activity was added to help facilitate conversation um, between the child and the caregiver um, around a shared um, activity or toy. Um, if a child is having a hard time unlocking the doors um, and having uh, and that's making the conversation difficult, then we want to be able to help them um, unlock it because uh, the purpose is really to kind of create that back and forth dialogue. Um, so the next one we have is the BOSA F1, which is for verbally fluent children ages six to eight up through 10. Um, you're going to see a similar setup. Um, this version should be done at a table um, as the games, it really helps with the, the games that we're doing. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so the, the BOSA F1 consists of um, five different activities. Um, and they should, it should last for 14 minutes. Um, we start with a fun, active game that requires um, little to no talking. Um, it's just really there as a warm up. Then we move into a turn taking game um, with some added social question cards, um, many of which are actually based off of the ADOS questions. Um, these cards should be asked in order. So when preparing the materials, we wanna make sure um, that you have them set up so that the card labeled number one is asked first. Um, only a, the adult will be asking questions in this version, um, but they should also answer the question after their child does. Um, after they have had some time to warm up with this game and social questions, they will then be required to have a conversation with no materials present. Um, we provide some options for topics that they can discuss and they can also build on conversations um, that were initiated during the game and social questions. Um, and then we repeat these steps. And um, as with the other versions as well, I should mention that it's really helpful to make sure the parents know they don't have to put all of the toys back in individual bags. We're trying to make the transition like as short as possible because this is a really brief assessment and we don't want to spend two minutes cleaning up all of the toys. So have something there for them that they are just free to kind of like push all of the toys in and set them aside and move on to the next activity. So the reason that we only have the examiner ask the questions in the F1 version is because there might be children that um, aren't able to fluently read at this time. So just to make it easier and more fluid for the assessment, only the adult will be asking questions on their turn. Um, but the adult should also answer the question. So they'll both just be answering the same question. The adult's just the one that's ask, reading it and asking. Um, and then we have the F2 version. Um, so same setup here, just different toys, um, games. Um, it consists of five activities, just like the last one. It'll be 14 minutes, um, starting off with a warm up game like Slapjack, then moving into the turn taking game um, like Jenga with the social question cards. Um, in this case, both the examiner and the participant will each have their own pile of questions. Um, we have selected questions for each of them to ask. So they're labeled whether or not these are the client's questions 
are the participants questions or the caregivers questions. So just keep that in mind when you're setting up the materials. Um, they're also numbered. So you'll want to make sure that the number one is going to be the one that's on top and the first one that they will ask. Um, so they'll take turns playing Jenga and asking each other's questions. They should also answer the question that they ask their partner. So if I say, what's your favorite color? And Deanna tells me hers is green, then I would also say, oh, mine's blue. So you still are answering both, um, but both people will be reading and asking questions. Um, after the game portion with the questions, we will then move on to conversation with the materials not present. So again, we'll want to just push over the materials as quickly as possible to transition into the conversation phase. Um, and similarly, we have some topics that they can discuss on the instruction sheet and um, or they can continue with conversations that they've already maybe started during the um, using those question cards. Um, and then we'll go ahead and repeat the games and conversation um, again after we do the first one. And it's okay um, to let them know, let the caregiver know it's okay to have a little bit of silence um, and that we want to limit the number of questions that we're asking. So we're not just sitting there during the conversation asking question and question. Um, to the participant. We really want to have it be more of like, you can stay statements and if no one responds, it's okay to have a little bit of silence. Um, so let the, the caregiver know this um, before getting started. And we will be working on materials um, and working on videos to get um, to all of you that are more representative of the BOSA administrations. All right, so now we're going to shift to talk about coding and some of the clinical considerations that we want you to be thinking about. Um, so in terms of how you do this process, so after you uh, have the parent or the therapist administer the BOSA, you are going to code using the regular ADOS2 protocol that you would use based on the individual's language level and age. Then we are going to have DSM-5 checklists for you to transfer those codes onto. And so I'm going to go through all of the parts of this to explain how it works. First, I just want to zoom in so I can cue you into the different sections that are on here. And then I'll show you a sample that actually has scores in it. So we have one DSM-5 checklist for every module. Again, that's based on the child's or the individual's age and language level. Uh, you can fill in all of this information at the top. We do have the A1 code, the overall language of non-echoed spoken language, so we can track that, track what the child's language was. Uh, you can have that information at the top. And then we have it split into the two domains in the DSM-5. So we have impairment and social communication and social interaction on this side. And then you'll see we have that broken down into our subdomains and we have our ADOS codes under each of those. We have stars next to ADOS codes that are algorithm items. And then on the right, we have restricted and repetitive behaviors. We also have the E codes from the ADOS on here uh, for you to track as well. And then we have some space for clinical notes or observations or things that you get from outside information, parent report, or additional information that you see um, or hear about. So you can track all of that on here. So let me show you an example of what this actually looks like filled in. And I have certain sections blocked out so I can show you one thing at a time. So you saw a BOSA, uh, you scored your ADOS to the best of your abilities, and then you transfer your ADOS scores here. So uh, you're going to score just as you would transfer those scores. And if you don't feel like you can score, you can put an NA in here as well. So once those are transferred, we have a recode rule on here. And this is, I briefly mentioned earlier, we have done some research to look at the zero to three codes that the ADOS provides and how we could convert those to binary codes. So this is zero or one. If the child gets a one, it means that this is a clin clinically significant symptom. Uh, and we did use data that we already had to back this up. So if the child has a two on A2, you can look at your recode rule and a two goes to a one, which is a clinically significant symptom. So you can do that for each of those. And then if the child has an eight, that would be an NA, we can't score that. So then you come up with your BOSA codes. And as you can look 
at this, the ones are signifying that this may be a clinically significant symptom. Of course, you want to use your clinical judgment and other information as well to determine if this is actually clinically significant. But from this observation, you're deeming that this, is, uh, this symptom is clinically significant. So you can kind of see how they map onto DSM-5 criteria. And this is actually based on a, a real child. And then once you have your BOSA codes for your convenience, we've also included a parent report column as well as an additional information column. So for parent report, if you did an ADI or other measure to uh, get report of autism symptoms from the parent, you can mark these with a check however you want so you can visually see where you got that other information. Say you did not have as many repetitive behaviors uh, and so they didn't might quite meet criteria on the BOSA, but based on parent report, maybe you did. Uh, so this will make that really clear for you. There's also, in each section, there's an other category. So here you can see uh, I specified that on the ADIR, this parent had noted that this child has no interest in other children. So I can mark that as a deficit in a social relationship, even though that's not mapped on, uh, on the ADOS or on the BOSA. So this just makes it really clinically helpful for us to see how the child uh, is meeting criteria or not. And then you can see for other info, I also uh, checked, you know, I saw some hand and finger mannerisms outside of the BOSA. And then I also saw some unusual sensory uh, behaviors. So I noted these down here. So I noted, so I can remember, I saw visual inspection with the toy train outside of the assessment. I also saw use of hand as tool and I saw some toe walking in the hallway. So those are all things you can note on this form. Another thing we're providing for you are the clinical summaries that I briefly mentioned. So this includes a few different things. It gives you that language of what the BOSA is and how it was developed to make it clear that this did come from adaptations of other measures. Uh, and it also talks about that binary coding. So it uses ADOS coding in a binary way converted to a zero or one presence or absence. It also includes examples from every version of the BOSA with some of those activities uh, in there described as, as you would need uh, to say what you did with that individual and who it was appropriate for too, based on their language and age. And then it gives some examples of a child who did not meet autism criteria, did meet autism criteria, or that you just didn't have enough information. And so maybe you used the BOSE information you had to supplement with an ADIR. So we have examples of all of those so you can see. We also want to be really clear that the BOSA is a tool that we are hoping is really helpful during this time. There will be children who you don't feel confident about based on the BOSA and the parent report that you get. And so we also have an example of what you could do if you see a child and you do a BOSA, you think that this child needs a full in-person evaluation with an ADOS. And so we have language in there for you to show that you recommend that as well. And so this is just a little screenshot of just the first page. So you can see we give a description of what we're giving you, some of the examples. And then here starts the introduction. And so we have highlighted different parts that you can select from. So you would only select the things that apply to your, you know, your clinic or home setting, which version you use, and then you can delete the rest. And then we also go into how it was developed. Uh, and then a note about how you supplemented it. So you supplemented it with maybe an ADR, AD, ADIR or a medical history. Um, and then it goes into the different version examples. So that will all be provided to you in the materials. Some things to consider uh, when you're using this clinically, this is not meant to replace the ADOS. Uh, this is not a long-term solution for the ADOS. Of course, there are maybe some implications of how we could use this and it could be a supplement to the ADOS in the future, um, but that is not the purpose of doing this. And because of that, we want you to use this with your clinical judgment. So because this is a shorter sample, we're doing 12 to 14 minutes, we don't have as many presses. Uh, as the ADOS says, where you're specifically trying to elicit symptoms. And so certain symptoms may not be as readily available. We don't want you to rule them out because you don't see them in the BOSA. Uh, particularly, we think that the restricted and repetitive behaviors will be harder to see in this short sample. And so we really want you to rely on parent report for some of those things. 
Because of that, there's this risk for a false negative or saying that a child or an individual does not have autism when they actually do, because this is brief and it's limited in scope. So we want you to be careful about that. The other note we wanna make is that based on that analysis we did of the binary codes, uh, the cutoffs that we found for optimal sensitivity and specificity, again, this is on the ADOS, this is not on the BOSA, but those cutoffs were pretty low. So if you're used to looking at ADOS cut cutoffs that you would normally say, you know, this is clinically significant based on the ADOS, uh, our cutoffs that we're seeing are really like a four or a five. Again, that's because this is binary. So we're taking a score of zero to three and we're putting it down to zero or one. Um, so, and it's a limited context. So we really want you to be careful when you see a low score, not to inaccurately rule out autism because it's a low score. We also want to note that there's no severity rating like we have in the ADOS with the CSS scores. So this is just presence versus absence of symptoms. And we don't have it at this point where you can total up your numbers to get something that's meaningful. So um, no totaling, this is just so you can look across the SM5 criteria to see what symptoms that individual is exhibiting. This is also not an outcome measure. So you cannot use any of these scores, um, you know, to say the child has changed or made progress. Uh, if you're interested in the BOSC, which is our measure of treatment change over shorter periods of time, uh, please contact us. That's available for research purposes, but that is something that we do in person, um, which is why the BOSA is a little bit different. We also want to caution you that there are many items on the ADOS that could be linked to autism, but are not necessarily specific to autism. So we also want to alert you of this potential risk for a false positive. So you see that there's actually a lot of things that they're scoring on, but that does not necessarily mean that they have autism. So we need your help because we are still developing this measure. And so we'd love if you are going to be doing this in your clinical setting, if you're willing to share your de-identified data with us, we are going to work to make this a, a better measure and really work with the psychometrics. So um, please help us do this and know that there are limitations. We're, you know, we're using a measure that is not yet validated. Because of this, we need you to rely heavily on the other information you have. We need you to have a good developmental history a medical background and parent report of symptoms, either with the ADI or some other type of interview. And we also want to make sure that when you're using this, you know, you're using your clinical expertise. So you're looking across contexts, you're talking with parents, um, you could potentially even be doing other home observations to supplement this. We want to make sure you really are thinking about this clinically. Uh, what information you have and how you can use this to help you with that information as a standardized context. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can see all of us panelists and we are going to go into Q&A. And this will be moderated by Chrissy Tulin and Catherine Byrne. Hi, y'all. Um, we have gotten a lot of really great questions during the talk, and I know that we still have quite a few filing in, um, but we will go ahead and get started. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, so first question um, has to do with admin, and we've gotten this question in various forms, H has to do with um, the fact that today the videos that we watched were with trained examiners, and can you comment on how you might anticipate things being different or maybe challenging when parents are serving as examiners? Yeah, so we, we know some parents are more savvy uh, when it comes to supporting their child clinically. And so this is definitely something we want you to keep in mind. And because of this, Allison had mentioned briefly, we are making introductory videos that the parents can watch. Um, and Dr. Kim has used these in her lab as well that have worked really well so that they have a really good understanding of what the expectation is for them. We're also in those parent instructions giving some guidance on things like limiting questions, as Allison had mentioned, so they really know what's expected. And you, as the clinician, during the evaluation, of course, we don't want you interrupting a lot, but you can tell them, you know, you can actually sit back a little bit and, and you don't need to ask as many questions or just see how he wants to play. Um, so you can use all of those different techniques, but, but we know this is hard and we know that parents vary a lot with this. And I think 
sometimes you have to make a clinical judgment about how much um, information that you want to use from BOSA if you think that for some reason the administration is spoiled or um, the parents are very prompty because, I mean, even after um, clinician jumping in um, to guide them. Um, so depending on how it looks, I think you might have to make a decision about whether you need to supplement it with other measures or have the parents come back with the child for um, in-person assessments later. So um, there is going to be a lot of flexibility around um, making clinical judgment based on the BOSA. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, moving on to the next question. Can parents use toys that they have at home for the BOSA rather than the ADOS toys? So we've We've used the ADOS toys um, because they were specifically selected um, to elicit certain behaviors consistent with autism. Um, and they've been validated and standardized as part of the ADOS. Um, and the um, BOSC materials were actually selected to be very similar to the ADOS materials. So we're really wanting to stay um, with the materials that we have selected um, to make sure that this is as standardized as possible. And Catherine, I know that there were some questions about the logistic around sending ADOS kits home and all of those. So um, that's something that each site has to decide because um, the ADOS materials are definitely not cheap and um, you want to consider um, how you can ship them to each family and they, the families have to ship it back to you. Um, so there's extra steps um, you know, that you have to take to ensure that the, um, the administration is standardized um, in home setting. Um, and I would say that if you can bring the families into clinic, that's probably the best scenario. But if that's not feasible for many reasons, you might consider um, sending the materials home, but know that, you know, there is that extra step you have to take and also make sure that you sanitize materials once you get them back um, before you use it for other families. Thank you for that. Um, so another question that we had, to, that we got a few times is about mitigating distractions in the home environment. How do you suggest that we prepare the home environment if parents are going to be doing this at home? Um, so uh, we have been doing this um, for our families who come to um, um, our lab for research studies. Um, and uh, there are strategies that we've used um, um, that are common sense, like, you know, make sure that the parents turn off TV or other, um, you know, things that make lots of noise, no, you know, dishwasher or anything like that running um, while you administer the BOSC. Also, um, you know, uh, if there's a sibling that can be pretty hard um, to engage the child um, and um, it, it's only 12 minutes or, you know, 15 minutes or 16 minutes. Um, but if you can have someone else in the home um, who can watch the siblings while um, another parent carries this out, um, that'll be most ideal. I know that can be pretty challenging during this time. Um, so, you know, pinpointing the time that works for um, for the family will be um, important. Um, and then we've also sent a mat um, to define the space so that we can have the child stay on the mat and then have the parent, you know, encourage the child to stay on the mat instead of, um, you know, running around the home. Um, so that can be also helpful. Um, but um, I mean, we have a lot of um, expert clinicians on the call. And if you guys have more suggestions, we are happy to um, get those suggestions from all of you as well. Um, Awesome. Um, so then the next question um, is, have you administered the BOSA minimally verbal on any adults? Um, and are the toys appropriate for adults who um, have limited speech? Um, so we haven't done the BOSA um, with the minimally verbal BOSA with adults, but we have done 
BOSC minimally verbal with adults, and we use modified toys. So what you would want if you, if this is a population that you're working with, then you would likely have the adapted ADOS, and you can reach out to us and we can help discuss what materials from the adapted ADOS would be best to create the sets of toys to interact with during um, the free play portion of the assessment. So again, we would want those adapted ADOS materials and, and we would be happy to discuss which toy should should be a part of that. And Allison, those adapted ADOS materials, some of them are available online, right? So they can, um, each site can purchase them, right? I, I believe so. Okay. okay. Next question. Um, so we know that that age range of six to eight is a little bit, you have to use your clinical judgment in determining whether or not you want to administer a PSYF or an F1. So if you have a kid that is in that age range, is it, can you do both assessments to get more complete information? And secondly, can you switch between those modules? Um, so I think that, um, Again, you have to make a clinical judgment about this. I wouldn't necessarily do both and get information from both contexts. Um, I would probably start with whatever you think is more appropriate and then you know, have the other materials ready um, if you think that you have to go up or go down depending on how the interaction goes. But then you have to remember, just like switching the modules on the ADOS that, you know, um, you need to have all the materials ready and then have parents get ready for the other version um, and, you know, retrain them um, if you ever have to switch. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, the next question is um, kind of a two-part question. Um, will the BOSA be a replacement for the ADOS post-COVID? Um, and then kind of pertaining to the same thing. When COVID is over, do you suggest that you still carry out a full ADOS on that same child? So yeah, I think I mentioned earlier, this the plan is not for this to be a replacement to the ADOS. And we know that you're going to get different information. And you know, as a clinician, you're going to notice that you're getting different information than you would from an ADOS. Um, this is a standardized way to collect an observation that hopefully will help you lead you to a diagnosis or not, because it's going to give you some really important information on social communication skills. Um, but when we can do ADOSs again, we definitely, you know, the ADOS will still stand as the gold standard, I'm sure. Um, if you feel like you don't have enough information from the BOSA, of course, doing that follow-up ADOS once we can be in person would be recommended. I mean, we, we're hoping that you're making a judgment only if you feel confident that you have enough information. So I would say if you felt really confident and had enough information across context, across different reports and your observations, then I would say you probably do not need to do an in-person ADOS at that point after COVID ends. Um, but if you at all feel like your information is limited, then of course doing that in-person evaluation will probably give you more information. Thank you. Um, so we had another question about um, doing assessments remotely. And can we speak to the usability of Zoom? Um, have we tested this? Um, I know that in our lab, we haven't necessarily done the BOSA over Zoom, um, but we have done the BOSC over Zoom and recorded it that way. And I know that that has tended, it's, it's worked pretty nicely, but was wondering if any of you all had other thoughts to add to that. Um, at our side, um, we haven't done a lot of um, assessment, the BOSA um, over telehealth. We actually have done um, home BOSC based on video instruction that we send families and they watch it and they do it on their own without us walking them through on tele on Zoom. Um, I imagine that having the Zoom on top of the video instruction that we will send our families will be way more helpful because then we'll be available to walk them through. So I can imagine that it'll be actually better 
um, than having the parents carry it out on their own. Um, but at the same time, um, you have to make sure that the families have the right camera or the laptop with a camera or use the phone. Um, sometimes give, um, sending out a tripod helps if they want to use the phone to prop it up so that they can put it and, and uh, um, administer. There was another question in the Q&A about um, doing the BOSC um, over telehealth with the examiner on the other side. And we have not done that before and we do not recommend it because we always had the interactant within the same space um, as um, the, the, um, the examinee. Um, so um, we want to make sure that that's clear, um, that we have not um, done any BOSC or BOSA um, with the interactant in the other side over telehealth. And that's not something that we recommend. Thank you. Um, would you guys be able to speak to the total cost um, of this assessment in terms of um, also including the toys that will need to be purchased outside of the ADOS kit? So outside of the ADOS kit, um, the materials for the F1 and F2 runs at about $100 for all of the games and activities. And then for the materials that the house um, activity, that is about another 25. And then there's an additional item that you can use instead of the house, which is in the instructions. And that's also about a $25 toy. Um, and then the replacement of, it would just be the replacement of any of the ADOS materials. So those can be found um, at toy stores or Amazon or any other online toy store um, at relatively um, cheap prices. Um, so. Each site needs ADOS kits though, because there are a lot of things that are in the ADOS kits that you have to get, especially for the minimally verbal and the um, PSYF version. Thank you, Sophie. We've gotten a couple of questions also about concerns about um, exposure to the same toys, test, retest, reliability, um, or like concerns about practice effects basically with the kids. Um, and can you, can you guys address that? <laughs> yes, so um, we know that um, the ADOS, there's no practice effect, and that's pretty cl clearly written in the um, ADOS manual and also um, in many research studies that we've done. Um, we have repeated the ADOS pretty frequently um, every two months, three months for little ones, um, and every six months to a year um, for adults, and we haven't uh, found any practice effects with the ADOS. Um, with the BOSC, um, we also see um, significant changes over time, um, as short as three months. Um, and um, with the BOSC, um, you know, having the BOSC repeated, it is created as a, you know, a treatment outcome measure to be sensitive enough to pick up changes. Um, so um, we, you know, we don't see any um, practice practice effects with the BOSC. Um, with the BOSA, we haven't um, validated the BOSA yet. Um, so that's something to look at. I you know, imagine that there's probably minimal practice effects because we are really looking at core symptoms of autism um, that do not change as much over time. Um, so um, that's our expectation. But again, that's something that we should look into more. Also, I think because only parts of this are taken from the ADOS um, and it's so brief that I wouldn't necessarily be concerned about needing to do an ADOS after this. Can you clarify that, Allison? So um, you mean you don't necessarily worry about the practice effects when you repeat the ADOS right after the BOSC? Uh, yeah, so doing an ADOS after a BOSA. Um, so if, if we determine that a child needs an ADOS, I wouldn't be concerned because it's such a About brief... the practice effects. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Good. 
Thank you both. Um, so we have had a few questions about adults who live alone. Do you think that you guys could speak to um, how this would work to conduct the assessment with adults who live alone? Would they need to invite a familiar person to join them, um, et cetera? I think that um, the point um, is that the BOSA can be flexible in terms of um, using um, any caregiver or anyone who is pretty familiar with um, the person. So if the adult has a therapist, job coach, social worker who has been working with that person pretty um, regularly, if the adult is in like a partially independent living, if there's like um, a support, um, who is pretty familiar with that person, um, we can definitely use that person as a potential interactant. Um, Allison, you wanna add anything? Yeah, so I, I think um, the way that we have set this up is so that ideally it's someone that doesn't have to be wearing any PPE um, because a mask or any other PPE will cause the same kind of problems that we were having with the ADOS. It um, will impact the social validity of the, um, the context that we're creating. And so we really, it should be someone that doesn't need a mask. So whether it's somebody that they're living with, a caregiver, or maybe like I, I do know in certain places, um, therapists are not necessarily wearing protective equipment. So it's somebody that you would be seeing regularly um, and comfortable in a situation where you aren't wearing a mask. And if that's not feasible, then um, I would suggest that we have to consider other options other than the BOSA or um, way for the in-person assessment. All right, um, I think we're going to transition now into some questions about research um, and coding. And so first question is, can the BOSA be used, I, I know you talked about this in your presentation, but just to clarify, can the BOSA be used to confirm diagnosis for eligibility for research purposes? Um, and what about as an outcome measure? Yeah, so, so yes, you can use it for research if you have, you know, other modes of information in order to say this is autism or this is not autism. We don't want you using it as an outcome measure or with any score because we don't have any valid scores for you to use yet. So it could not be, you know, say eligibility criteria to get into your study would be a score of six on the BOSA. We don't have a cutoff like that at this point. So the only way you would be using it is if you need to know, does a child have autism or not, you can use this as a tool to determine that. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, and then how does the BOSA compare to other remote measures such as um, the Vanderbilt ASD telepedes, SORF, NODA, things like that? So I think the primary thing is we, we aren't trying to compete with anybody. Um, we really created this just to make sure that we could cover all age ranges and provide a tool based on the ADOS that could be used during this time. So um, we really wanted to make sure that we can, um, you know, have it be anybody that we would be seeing for an ADOS. And I'll add to that, you know, you could also use the tools that you have available. So I'm familiar with the source because that's my research. And if I were to see someone clinically uh, in my practice, I would probably do a SORF and a BOSA. So so use the tools you have. Again, like Allison said, it doesn't need to be one or the other if they're going to complement each other. Um, but we do know certain tools only work for certain age ranges and this works as Allison set up through adults. Great. Um, another question that we have received a few times. So just to clarify, can BOSA materials be translated into other languages? At this time, no. Uh, we definitely know that there's a need for that and we, we are hoping that we are able to do that. Um, first, I do wanna say if, 
you know, if you are doing it in another language, hopefully you have the ADOS that's translated into that language and you're using those materials for the coding. Um, like I mentioned, for the questions and the parent instructions, we realize that that, you know, it's really important for those things to be translated, but we do need the permission to do that. So if you're interested, definitely contact us. Um, that's a direction we'd like to go in. We just can't give permission to do that at this point. Awesome. And it looks like that we don't have too many more questions that we haven't covered, which is wonderful. Awesome. I'm going to share some of our closing information so we can have it up on the screen. Um, and I'm hoping some of the panelists could also be sharing some links in the chat uh, while I have this up here. So so like we mentioned, the recording will be up on uh, the YouTube channel. And so people will be able to access it. They're actually, um, I'm not sure if it's created yet, but we are in the process of creating a separate page for Dr. Lord's materials because she's done a couple talks at this point. So we will have this training up. We'll have the slides up. Uh, we will also have the link for the permission of use agreement. Um, but we'll also share that in the chat right now. So just to remind you all, if you, you know, you're an ADOS user, you can fill out this permission of use agreement. Once you confirm that you agree to all of those things, uh, it will send you to another link to a Google Drive. So uh, you will have all of the materials available and they are all ready. So you can have immediate access to those once you fill out that permission of use agreement. We will also email these things, but we've been having issues with our uh, Gmail capacity. So if you can copy links, that would be amazing. And then our email address is up here, makingbettermeasures at gmail.com. You can contact us with questions at that email address. Uh, also, I didn't mention, but for sharing de-identified data on the permission of use agreement, there actually is an option for you to check if you're interested in that. Um, that's not committing you to anything, but that means that we can contact you to, to discuss more about sharing data. All right. Well, we will leave this up for a minute, but thank you all so much for joining us. We're so excited to see all of the interest just with the attendance today. It's really, really amazing how many people uh, are interested in finding a way to still see patients and participants for research uh, in any way that they can with the COVID restrictions. So we're really excited to work with you all and, and try and figure out the best way to do that. And, um, and hopefully these materials will be really helpful, but feel free to email us with any questions as you're accessing them um, and seeing how it works in your setting. But thank you so much. We really appreciate it and hope you all have a wonderful day.